Namaste, Sasrakar, and Salam, friends. Welcome to yet another episode of the talk show Sajan Naya Tourism, Hospitality, and Aviation. Today, our guest is Mr. Kunal Kotari. Hi, Kunal, how are you? Hi, hey, uh, Sajan, I'm good as well. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me take the pleasure of introducing him. Our guest today is Kunal Kotari. He has more than 20 years of experience in the travel industry. In these 20 years, he has worked in all major departments, including tour escorting, operation, and sales and marketing. He has, he has also had an international experience working in the Gulf region. As a service provider, he has experience in providing services to B2B and B2C. His love and passion is always railway travel. As his dream came true, when he got an opportunity to work with Rail Europe as regional sales manager, covering a lot of countries in Asia. Today, we discuss URail with Kunal Kotari. Hi, Kunal. Welcome again. Thank you. Kunal, uh, the two, first question has got two parts to it. One is, uh, of course, mm -hmm. what is URail for those who have not heard of it? And second thing is, is it something similar to our Indian long distance train? Is it the same? How would you, how would you put it in a capsule? Uh, well, I mean, given the success of DDLJ, uh, it's very unlikely people have not heard of URL. But, uh, well, there will be some who haven't seen it in, in the last 25 years that it is running. And again, post COVID, it is again running. So I'm, I'm planning to make a visit sometime soon. Yeah. But uh, on, on, uh, if, when you see uh, the comparison between long distance trains, URail uh, is basically covering not just one country, it's covering almost the whole continent of Europe. That's how the name URail, it's European rail. But uh, URail is uh, formed by, you know, the big uh, railway networks of, of uh, the respective yeah. countries as a marketing arm to promote the fact that, you know, people coming to Europe could travel by train. And uh, it's 61 years now since uh, that company was, uh, you know, brought to life. And uh, from having just one pass to cover, you know, multitude of countries, now they have so many variants. Like uh, when I began, there were just two URL passes. There was a URL pass covering 17, 18 countries. And then there was something called a URL pass, which was basically for the really popular uh, Western European countries. Uh, you know, the big five, France, uh, Benelux countries, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and Spain. Then you could add on an Austria, Hungary, or uh, uh, Portugal and stuff like that. But that, that was it. Two simple products and end of the story. Today, they have so many different combinations. I mean, uh, two years ago, they also had two country combinations with which they have uh, stopped starting last year. They only have single country pr passes and now they have the whole uh, all Europe passes. Now, with, with an all Europe pass, you could start somewhere in Ireland and end up in Turkey using the trains. You can imagine how big that distance is. And... Um, you know, of course, it would take you about a week to get from point A to point B in this case. But uh, yes, it's practically possible. Of course, no direct trains on such a long distance. Uh, but there are quite a few, quite a few uh, which are really long distance trains. Just for my understanding, that means uh, uh, these trains are specifically only for tourists or anybody who wants to travel across Europe like, like our long distance train. Is it a, or is it multiple usage? <laughs> Well, actually, to be honest, uh, just like in India, who are the main occupants of the trains? Indians. Indians. Civil, uh, more than 97% occupancy okay. is the themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, they, when people are doing a long distance train, it's for tourism purpose. I mean, nobody's doing a business trip going from, let's say, Rome to Paris on an overnight journey. It's not going to be for business. It is always going to be for a holiday. You know, like a 16 hour, 18 hour journey, nobody's taking for, for business. It, people generally then take 
take a flight which is much shorter than than an overnight journey right so uh, yeah i mean you can say they are tourists whether european tourists or international tourists but mostly long distance trains uh, they would be for tourists okay. ideally so we progress to the next question is uh, one is how many countries does it cover today and second part is how do they operate so many countries how is the company operating how is this management how does it work as such so many countries so many people yeah well complicated to be honest like um, like in india we have uh, the northern railways the northeast railways the central railways yes. western railways yes. similarly uh, yes. you know in europe uh, it covers about india is about 70000 kilometers of railway network okay right okay is uh, about 250000 kilometers of railway network so nearly nearly four times and uh, and it's only improving you know western countries western european countries have a very good network already but then it's the eastern european ones who obviously for uh, you know financial reasons haven't invested too much into it but now they are so uh, it's only going to get up to like this at some stage will be about 270 to 80000 um, in in the coming years and um, why well, you could um, for the national uh, each national company the national railway of let's say a france and a germany with the fact that they have open borders it makes it easier for them and when they are running a train between two countries it's a mutual agreement so the french railways run one train and simultaneously german railways are running an alternate so it's always a you know, give and take relationship especially when you see french and the germans they they've had a very fantastic relationship in the past with the wars but uh, yeah uh, you know that's how uh, they manage uh, you know the relationship between the railway companies and uh, obviously the western european countries have a much higher um, number of tourists coming globally and uh, as compared to the eastern europe so they obviously have a slightly more bigger say in the way eurail works but uh, yeah i think it's it's the coordination between all the railway companies that are involved and all of them are mostly national carriers except in countries like uk which uh, is a private uh, you know uh, about 18 different private operators running the show in in uk as of now which uh, the the current government is trying to change and bring everything under the national carriers and uh, in switzerland Uh, as well there are a lot of uh, private operators uh, actually everything is mainly run by private operators uh, but there is a major uh, player called uh, sbb which is the biggest player in in switzerland as far as rail uh, line is concerned but otherwise it's mainly uh, everything is nationalized it sounds interesting and very complicated also yes very complicated sometimes sometimes when new new announcements are made there was i mean about 12 13 years ago uh, between london and paris as you know uh, there is the eurostar using the famous euro tunnel uh, that i remember watching on the world this week back then when we were kids when they were digging from both sides and at some stage yeah, they were yeah, yeah, sure yeah yeah france yeah 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 so uh, when uh, when the train you know you're coming up to a stage where you want a underground tunnel or or rather a tunnel that's under the sea bed uh, connecting between the island of europe with the main continent just so that you know that's uh, there's more connectivity and it it has nearly uh, train travel and especially the high speed one as in some sectors act- actually killed uh, air traffic completely for example between paris and belgium uh, and brussels the train only takes 1 hour 20 minutes there is no way that you can fly faster than that because uh, you know airports in europe given it's it's a fairly old uh, you know developed continent most of the airports are outside the city by the time you get there it's about an hour and then uh, your flight is going to be about 20 30 minutes and then you check out and get back to uh, the city that's about an hour 45 minutes so it just can't get faster from city center to city center in under one and a half hour it's the fastest uh, way to travel 
especially Western Europe with the high speed trains, it's a completely, uh, you know, game changing uh, way of traveling. I like the way you said it, the expression. I felt like I'm going from Adheri to Churchgate. That's how you told me. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll progress ahead. And uh, uh, what is this URL pass and how is it available to tour operators in India? How, how does the mechanism work? In, as a, if I want to buy or if I want to... How, is it, how does it work? Uh, but I missed a part of your last question, which was how many countries does it cover? Yes, so it yes. covers... A- 30 countries, approximately 30, 31 countries, still uh, uh, some parts of, uh, you know, former Russia, uh, like the Ukraine and uh, Latvia and all of those uh, are still not having a rail network that is connecting with, with the URL. But I also guess they have their, uh, you know, they have more important fish to fry than, than you know, focus on getting to this by train. But uh, yeah, so um, in all, uh, sorry, come again with your question. Uh, so I think, uh, what is URL pass and uh, uh, yes. how, 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 how is it available to tour operators in, in India? How is it available? Right. So, uh, URL uh, has a selling arm called URL.com, but uh, that's mainly B2B. When it, when you are talking B2C, uh, B2C, sorry, but when you're talking B2B, they have uh, something what, you know, the trade industry calls uh, GSAs, general sales agents, uh, players like uh, distributors like uh, Rail Europe or ACP, uh, Rail Tour, you know, so, uh, and now I think uh, Booking.com was supposed to be signed up very soon, but I, I'm not sure on that and uh, train line and companies like that, they are signing up and they will be the distributors. I think with the train line, I think, or, or a booking.com is still far more B2C. When it comes to B2B, there's Rail Europe. There, there used to be this company which shut down earlier this year called Student Travel Association, okay. STA. They were uh, the agents as well. And then, of course, ACP, I mentioned, Rail Tour. And... Um, DB, that's uh, German Railways, and uh, Trenitalia, which is the Italian Railways, both have, uh, you know, small distribution arm, overseas distribution arm, which are also uh, GSS for the URL products. So they sell their trains and URL passes as well. Oh, very interesting. Uh, again, a tourist, uh, tourist point of view is what my question is. Uh, if I travel by in Europe by URL and or I opt for going by air. What is the difference in the two? And which one is is it just economical? That economical that URL is preferred? What is it like? Uh, Why well, you you can uh, divide it into two? Okay, mainly European rail travel, uh, shorter journeys, and on high speed trains. So yeah. then just stick with the Western European countries. There in that case, uh, obviously trains are faster. Uh, when I say they are faster, of course, they are not uh, running faster than, than the flights. Yes. But like I said, uh, they go from city center to city center. You don't have to travel that 40, 50 minutes to the airport. You don't have to queue up for uh, your check-in, security, all of that jazz. And then on arrival as well into the final destination, you are about half an hour, 45 minutes at least out of the city. So all that put together uh, anything that is a four four and a half hour journey is faster by train than by plane so up to four and a half hours journey by train is almost the same time if you include from your door to uh, your final destination door uh, by flight it would be the same amount of time so anything less than that obviously flights are uh, a complete no no so let's say, uh, for example, you take a uh, distance between Madrid, Barcelona. When I started, it was about seven hours. Uh, in 2003, they decided to refurbish their whole tracks, bring in high-speed trains. Now it's two and a half hours. It's like one third. Now, if you fly, it's going to be about the same time, maybe slightly more because you have to check in. And I think that really kills. My- 90 to 100 minutes of check-in and uh, all of that jazz really takes a lot of time 
whereas uh, when you're coming from the city center to the city center two and a half hours flat you are in the other city i mean from barcelona to madrid there are two big cities madrid is right in the middle of it's like the center of a circle more or less if you look at uh, it geographically barcelona is on the Med mediterranean sea two and a half hours that's like you don't even need to think and because it, uh, the journey is that short because of the high speed trains the frequency is damn high so you don't i mean they're competing literally with a flight because uh, even if there's an hourly departure the number of passengers a flight can take vis-a-vis -a, -vis a train can take straight away it's at least double if not more and i think it's more than double because when you're when you're uh, running when you're flying shorter journeys they use the a320s wow. The smaller planes. So I mean, more than four times. I, I think a train generally would take anything between 600 to 800 passengers. It's nearly the uh, three to four times that capacity. And with an every hour departure, I think uh, to quite an extent, it's it's a clear no-brainer. Up to four four and a half hours, you just don't look at uh, flight as an option. Especially Western Europe. When it comes to high-speed trains, of course. Um, regular speed trains, um, yeah, you could think about it. How about the money part of it, uh, which is more economical? Uh, well, you might have a cheaper air flight, but when you're looking at the cost of the ticket, you're just looking at that ticket. You need to, when you're looking at an air ticket, you also need to add, add your expenses of getting to the airport and getting away from the airport, which in case of a train is not existing. So, uh, more or less, it works out to the same cost. But when you're looking at a pass, pass generally is useful when uh, you're doing multiple journeys. Whether it's a single country pass or a multi-country pass, when you're doing more journeys, then the pass is very useful. Because um, if you, let's say, I mean, the young kids today would maybe not want to stay in Barcelona, but just make a day trip or go there for a party. So they're not staying there per se. Uh, they might leave uh, Madrid and come back in the evening yeah. or late at night, right? So uh, it is practically possible. I mean, I, I really wouldn't do it at my age, but uh, you know, yeah. somebody who's 19, 20, the young travelers, for them, it's possible to do. So um, in that case, if I was taking a point to point ticket, I would have to take a return ticket. Whereas if I had a pass, within the day, I could do as many trips as I want. So I, I may not be in Madrid, I could be in Cordoba, which is about hour, hour and a half away from um, you know Madrid. And then go onwards to Barcelona and then come back to Cordoba. You could it would still be just one day instead of uh, you know having to take four different tickets, which would be far more expensive as compared to uh, taking a pass. Very interesting. Uh, if I want there was a time we used to really calculate a lot of things before advising whether the passenger should take a point-to-point -point ticket or uh, take a pass. So now, I mean, when like I said, when when I started, the options were very less. So just a URL pass or a Euro pass. So uh, then we really needed to compare whether the point-to-point -point tickets uh, with the reservation are cheaper or just the pass with the reservation works out cheaper. Now it's much more easier. If you're doing a single country, more often than not, you have four journeys, uh, decent distance, blindly just take the pass. So, since you have been so, so much with URL and you know, you, you know about the sector so well, if I'm a traveler to Europe, uh, and I want to use URL. What would be your tips be, or what would be your advice be? What is the how to uh, your 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 point of view of how to use it the best way? First things first. People need to get their itinerary together. You know, uh, look up the map, decide what direction they want to go in. You know, uh, figure out what airline you're flying, where you're landing, where you're exiting. Uh, Europe is is a big continent, and although on on the map it may look a very small piece, but it's fairly large. People uh, ideally either uh, if you want to do multi countries, start from one des uh, one location and finish in another. Don't have to come back. I mean that's a lot of time wasted. You could rather add an extra night or two 
uh, at another destination or just explore a certain destination more right so ideally we start with finalizing what you want to cover and more likely at least have a rough idea in what direction you want to go right where not to south or what cities in which order uh, then of course i mean nobody is an expert uh, as as a self traveler so ideally go to a travel agent who will give you more details on uh, whether there are direct trains or not uh, you know in the same itinerary you could have two or three options because a certain route may not have a direct train even if it's a shorter journey right so uh, sometimes people tend to uh, agents tend to redirect it that way because it makes life easier right Where with luggage you don't want to change you want as less changes possible in the whole journey the whole holiday as you know uh, as many direct trains as possible so uh, take a help of a, of a travel agent uh, get him to uh, suggest the best option and uh, then you can decide whether you need a single country pass multi country pass of course that that once you decide the country is it you know already but uh, yeah they will be also able to give you a breakdown whether pass would be cheaper or a point to point ticket would be cheaper it's so sometimes uh, what we've done is uh, just because uh, there's a small sector uh, for a flight for example like the guy is flying in and out of uh, flying in to rome and uh, flying back from brussels just because uh, he's only doing italy and france and brussels is only because of the flight we used to give only the flight ticket for paris brussels rather than give him a three country pass a two country pass was cheaper and just add that extra ticket so it, you know effectively you somebody needs to work on that bit as well and it's honestly not very easy for for a layman to decide ki i will do this or i'll do that ki yeah, i'll only go for a pass or i'll only go for point to point ticket it's it's given given the vastness of of the whole continent and the ease of traveling within it uh, makes things complicated uh, it sounds like yes you need to have an advisor a travel advisor so, uh, that 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 will be the best money can buy and you will have a easy absolutely. travel absolutely i mean you know time is money and in this case uh, i mean with trains so much more important you can't be taking a slow train when there is an option of a fast train That's saves right. you a couple of hours couple of hours a holiday is a big time and it's not that uh, uh, you don't see the scenery on a 300 km hour train you will still see the scenery and you will still see it as well as on a 100 km train yeah. so uh, it's no point wasting that time sitting on a train so all those kind of smaller things uh, you know only a travel agent can give you the options always better to do that all right uh, we'll get to the last segment of our interview and uh, this is uh, the indian context you know so my question is uh, you said on 30 countries and more are being added in your rail we are also a large country and we also have a very strong uh, railway system in india uh, do you think it is feasible to have something like that of a similar nature in india for tourist and is it what is what is your experience say will it work out like a something similar or do you think it is not something applicable um well i mean uh, there was a time there was a in rail pass i think they still have it okay but uh, i don't know how popular it is uh for a fact that you know uh, now of course air connectivity is way higher than what it was 15 20 years ago um and our trains are still running at about 87 kilometers an hour uh so you know uh, like i said time is money it might just it might just be more expensive to take a flight but then it gives you that extra time you know i i know of course uh, while you're flying you're only seeing one view that is of the clouds so uh, yeah you're losing out on a lot of view but uh, in india still i think 
I'm a big fan of the fact that uh, we might have a high speed rail someday. We desperately need it. India is really a large country. And if we have to get from Bombay to Delhi, for example, 16 hours in a time when, you know, flight takes are under two hours. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. I think desperately need a high speed line uh, connecting the major cities. You know, between Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai, uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and Bombay, yes, and then yes. some going to Bombay, Calcutta. Yeah. I, you know, railways needs to start making some profit somewhere. In India, we still far more lo- loss making, uh, you know, division for their government other than a profit making one. In in France, for example, I mean, because I work with Rail Europe, and uh, Rail Europe is. Uh, co-owned by SNCF, uh, which is the National Railways of France, they are a profit-making company. So, uh, you know, they, uh, there are times when uh, they have losses, but as, as a company, uh, they could have a year which is bad, but not like year on year, you don't have like 100,000 crore loss. Uh, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not how it should work. And because the government can't get profits, they don't introduce anything new. I mean, it's been, uh, I think I've seen the trains for 38 years of my life in the same way, vis-a-vis the last four or five years. You know, there have been far more changes over the last five, six years. Of course, it's not uh, all the single governments doing changes have been brought in. But, you know, even as people, we need to change. We, we had to say just what did we do? Sadly, you know, uh, so when the government's bringing change uh, with the high speed line, I think uh, the in rail pass could make a comeback whenever uh, that happens. Because um, right now it's, it's not making too much sense to, uh, for a foreigner to take a train other than experiencing it for, uh, you know, the experience sake. Uh, of course, the richer ones go on a, on a palace on wheels and the Deccan Odyssey yeah. and the yeah. Golden Jet and the likes. But uh, for a you know, mid, mid-level uh, tourist who can afford a domestic flight uh, is not going to take the train as of now. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, it was, it was still a lot more popular. You, we, we've done trips on, on trains and bumped into foreigners uh, enjoying the trip. But uh, yeah, now, now it's more experiential rather than uh, the need for it. Whereas in, when we are in Europe, you don't really want to fly, you might as well take the train. Okay. Different approach, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A very interesting. Kural, just a matter of discussion, I'm putting this question up. I got the answer already, but since I put up this question myself, uh, do you think pri- making rails in private in India can things speed up things? In the uh, Because if so many countries can work together in URail, why can't within India be better? We are not better in the last 30 years. So why can't we do that as such? What's your opinion? I think we can. Uh, from what I read last, um, government does want to have a privatization by about 2024. And, uh, but of course, they, uh, they need to have extra track. So uh, the plan is to, between the big cities, they free up a track by adding one uh, freight corridor, especially for the freight trains. Now, uh, currently, what happens because the passenger trains also use the same uh, tracks as the freight trains. Sometimes we all see how big the freight trains are, how fast they go, which is worse than a passenger train. So uh, I think that would be a big help. And in that case, they could run more trains just by freeing up that, uh, you know, keep keeping a separate corridor for, for the freight, freight trains between the big uh, sectors. Uh, they could be running a few more trains. Uh, some of them they could privatize. I mean, what's the harm? And especially trains like Train 18 or a Tejas, which are, you know, which are slightly upmarket vis-a-vis the normal trains. Why not? Why not? And that is the kind of train you would rather uh, privatize than 
uh, you know the threats. You don't you don't want to uh, have like the passenger trains on on privatized because it's not going to make sense for uh, not for the passengers, not for the uh, the owner or the operator or for the individuals. Um, similarly, uh, let me give you an example here with uh, Italy. Italy has, of course, Trenitalia, which runs its own trains, but uh, with a decree that came out by EU in about 2007, uh, private players could also be operating trains within Italy. So uh, one company uh, which was uh, formed together by um, owners of some of the big brands like Ferrari and Todd's Leather and some of those, in partnership with the French railways, came up with a company called NTV, and they run on the high-speed lines only, very restricted. They run between uh, Naples and uh, Milan en route. They cover, of course, uh, Rome, uh, Florence and stuff. They go to Genoa, they go to Venice, and that's the only route they run. They run about 50 trains a day, 50, 60 trains in a day. A day? And okay. A day, in all. In all, uh, all the routes put together, about 50, 60 trains the day that they run and uh, you know it's it's a profit making uh, thing for them initially of, of course it wasn't it took them about five six years to get there but uh, you know it, it's always good what happened with NTV coming because NTV was a new company they had the latest uh, rolling stock you know of the high speed train so uh, train Italia had to buck, uh, buck up and uh, you know uh, they improved their uh, service levels on those routes. They kept, they improved the trains. They got in a new rolling stock eventually. So uh, competition is always good on the same route, and especially if they are uh, you know high profit ones and or high passenger uh, line ones. So uh, high traffic ones. Sorry. So uh, it will always be good, and especially I mean for us. We are, uh, when we are privatizing, I think we have to look at uh, uh, having upmarket products which should be privatized. And uh, the passenger trains are passenger trains. I mean, so I think, and what happens is only the trains are operated and, uh, you know, managed by a certain private, right? The tracks are still owned by the government. So uh, for that as well, the government earns a revenue. Right for for the train that is operating on that certain route. So I think it's it's beneficial for from multiple angles. For the government, they have additional revenue. Uh, for us, as as a passenger, we have more options. It's uh, you know I know a lot of people who complain. I don't travel by Indian railways because they are shit. Okay, they could be bad, but then uh, the, if there is an option, you know people might at least give it a try. And if it is good. It is good you stick with the private operators and not, uh, you know, the national railways. It's been tried in the past, if, I, if I'm not wrong. They did try uh, privatizing Shatabdi, but it was uh, only the management. Uh, the operations and everything was still taken care of by Indian railways, but the management of the food and, and the service on board and all of that, that was privatized. Now, of course, that is managed everything by... Uh, IRCTC, which is uh, subsidiary of the Indian Railways. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a good option. I don't think 100% privatization happens in India. Uh, that's never going to happen with the railways. It's, it's, it's a very sensitive uh, subject uh, politically. But otherwise, I think, and I think given, given the kind of, uh, you know, difference of incomes people have and the kind of people majorly taking trains all the time, for that, uh, you know, travel. Um, it may not be fair also uh, on the people to privatize everything. But yeah, on, on the high traffic routes, why not? I mean, one or two trains, you know, between Bombay and Ahmedabad, there are eight trains in a day, each way. They could privatize one. Start with one, then you see the results. If it's better, get into two. There are like three night trains and there are five day trains. And all of them take about eight hours to get from point A to point B. Why not? They could always try it out. I just hope uh, uh, the officials get, have a hear here because uh, <laughs> because it's a very interesting discussion because you're you're suggesting a public private partnership. 
where uh, you know we also have a service mode of you know the poor and the, the, the they can also travel at the same time services can be upgraded and private partners can be bought into on board a very good suggestion i just hope it reaches them as such what we're talking today uh, could all last but let's see how how it works out i mean uh, it's only i recently read the article where they said they were going to privatize but uh, in what way they haven't really clarified they want to go away to have a uh, but let's see let's see we'll have to wait until further details unfold uh, the last question for for today kunal and this is a this is a more youngsters point of view who have you know have finished their course or in the last semester and doing their studying and they want to join the industry so mm-hmm. you, know, you have been through the same grind as such so the question is very relevant is that uh, uh, if i if i have finished my course i've been in the industry for one or two years how important is it for me to travel by urail actually you know experience it to sell it in india in mumbai city what is your point of view and how do you look at it yeah well, uh these days of course i mean everybody seems to think if i have seen it i can sell it um from my personal experience the first time i started selling trains in 99 jan 99 okay and the first time i actually saw a european train was in I lost you. Hi, Kunal. Kajin, sorry. Yeah. Stay for a while. Yeah. Even I lost you. Correct. Good. Yeah. So, uh, I was saying I started in Jan '99, and the first time I actually saw or sat in a European train was in 2002 November. So for almost four years, I I was selling the trains without having seen one in real life, or experienced one in real life. purely based on um and back then when we started you know there were not so many travelers as as today indians were traveling to europe but not in the numbers they do today so uh, for us it was like we sell a product and then follow up when the client is coming back we follow up sir how was the experience could you share some pictures and uh, you know maybe scan it or if you are coming this side just show us some pictures so for us also it was a learning I mean, the first time I, I I learned the difference between a first class and second class in Europe was through one of the pictures who, uh, where the client said, "You know what? Uh, all the jazz about you know extra leg space and all of that is great, but the major difference is that it's two seats aisle, one seat in first class, and two seats aisle, two seats. So you know the width is less. Of course, the leg room is slightly less, but it's not bad at all. So our first leg." basic difference was through a client who had traveled so uh, that's how you you know read the brochures read up i mean today we didn't even have the internet uh, giving us all the information as it does today so uh, read up uh, there are lots of more pictures today on on the internet we had to rely on clients and uh, their feedback so uh, there was a time i think 2 years down the line i have been asked by uh, you know clients saying How many times have you been there? And I'm like, uh, why? Because I I didn't want to be in a situation where I say zero and they say, then how are you selling me this? You're you're bluffing. So uh, I would always first ask why, and they would say, you know, it seems like you've been there a few times. Uh, well, if you feel that good for you, but I've never been there. Yes. So uh, also, yeah. break it to them. Yeah. Then. then uh, you know it's easier for uh, as a, as a travel consultant to say you know what sir clients like you are 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 learning database because you will come back you will give me a feedback i'll ask you some questions you will tell me something that i don't know and that that has happened there are so many things that even today i mean of course uh, we are in an industry where you never stop learning and even today some of the clients say look you told me this but actually you are slightly off mark there is a little bit of change here and you can't really keep up with everything so there's always a new learning from a client new 
the moment you tell them you know uh, clients like you help us uh, improve our knowledge they are also happy they come back with their feedback uh, and today i mean sharing pictures is far more easier they don't have to come to your shop and show you the album so uh, yeah i think it it uh, it's how you learn it's how you learn it's practically impossible i mean as a travel agent if i say i can sell any country in the world it's not going to be possible to travel to 106 countries right and experience and then come back and sell it's going to take me a lifetime just traveling all these countries and seeing every nook and corner which is good which is not good and then try selling it i, I am past my prime selling it utna paisa chahiye pehle ghumne ke liye so i think uh, you need to learn from the the information on hand and from client feedbacks i think that's the easiest way to do uh viewers i should i should comment on this because it's only experience can tell you this that you the the customer comes back to you and you says that there's no much difference between first class and second class because leg room is almost the same and from there you take up that clue and you pitch the next time next time you pitch to a customer you know what you're talking very interesting kunal exactly. very interesting uh Uh, yes we are really running out of time we have spoken for last 40 minutes now uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, i'll bid you goodbye today thank you for accepting the invitation and yes if if, if we can if we can have a conversation some of the topics some of the time we will definitely decide on that and we would like we would like to sure. have you back on the show sure sure uh, sajan thank you it was a pleasure yeah thank you so much bye bye